Hello, this is Ross, also known as Teacher Toolkit. This is a short presentation about three important pieces of research that I am currently involved in. Um, now, some of you may care, hopefully you do. I would imagine the vast majority don't, but um, there you go. These are the three pieces of research. Um, on the left, um, verbal feedback um, action research, where I'm hoping to share some work across uh, seven English schools uh, where when teachers talk to pupils they have same or better outcomes particularly with disadvantaged students so I'll go into that in more detail shortly uh, the image in the middle um, I'm picking my doctoral journey looking at social media uh, particularly Twitter and how it influences education policy and on the right um, of all the schools that I've visited uh, over a hundred plus in the last 12 months or so, I've identified 10 very different schools across the UK and I'm share some of the insights. Um, so this short presentation looks at all three. So the first one, uh, tweet me your thoughts, use at teacher toolkit and hashtag verbal feedback project. So the first original proposal, so I shared this on Twitter in 2016 and very quickly I gathered 110 schools in six countries without really understanding the difficulty that that would cause for myself to collect the data um, but the original proposal was to challenge that written feedback is the most valuable type of feedback in a classroom and particularly how in terms of high accountability for teachers working in state schools that it always was then required to be evidenced to show progress and that pupils were acting on what teachers had said um, of course that needs to happen but um, you can get lots of silly ideas uh, as a as a byproduct of that desire, so I um, gathered all these schools um, very quickly after a three or four months of trying. Um, I got way out of my depth. So then I, by chance, on a visit to UCL uh, down in London, um, presented the proposal, and um, they backed me and funded me. So we're currently conducting the verbal feedback research and development project. Um, so this is alongside um, the UCL. Uh, the widening participation project um, with a couple of academics there supporting me so we've got seven schools um, but let me just go back as to why this started so my passion with teacher workload first started about 2013 when Nikki Morgan the English Education Secretary of State at the time produced this workload challenge report and you can th see the particular top two recording input in data and excessive depth of mark in detail and frequency. And on my travels, um, I've polled about 15,000 teachers on that workload question. Uh, marking comes up time and time again in any type of setting, primary, secondary, independent, or international school. So it's confirmed my belief that we need to drastically reduce teacher workload in terms of marking and feedback. And although some schools that I've visited have the best policies in the world, I think what examination bodies require teachers to do will trump all of our best intentions. So I think we probably need to look at reform at a higher level beyond just the school organisation. Um, other reasons, so this research from colleagues at Cambridge, um, comparing state schools and independent schools, both teachers in different settings will work typically 55 hours per week to keep up with their workload. But the key difference between state schools and independent teachers, sorry, state teachers and independent teachers, is that state school teachers are often asked to complete meaningless tasks. Um, and you can see there the monitoring of marking exercise books was the top result. I'm always surprised how few people understand or even are aware of the Department for Education workforce census in England. So some quick statistics, there are 451,000 teachers in state schools today. There are about 350,000 qualified teachers, including myself, who are not working in schools. And that data goes back 10 years. But this data here on the screen goes back 25 years. If you look on this right column here, you'll see typically 20-ish thousand teachers enter the profession every year. Now, last year was the first time ever in this data collection that more teachers left teaching than entered. It was only by a few hundred, but it's the first time it's happened. And my worry is that looking at perceptions on social media, um, that I suspect 
we may have more teachers leaving the profession this academic year, so this will be July 2019, than those entering. And then you can see the data that goes over the each year. So me, I'm off the scale there. 25 years, I was about a 38% chance of staying in teaching. Uh, I've signposted Malcolm Gladwell's book there, Outliers. You may have heard the comment, 10,000 hour rule, bastardised and misinterpreted. But if we just take that as a ballpark figure for a full-time classroom teacher who works... 750 hours per academic year you're looking at about 13 years of teaching to reach what Gladwell would call mastery or really master uh, being secure in the classroom but we know we often hear that teachers leave within the first five years well that sounds bad when we hear that on so um, on the news and so, uh, social media but actually when you dig into the details the greatest attrition is in the first two or three years obviously we don't want to promote that to the world um, so these are the reasons why um, teacher workload is a serious issue. So my objective, so with the UCL support, um, what I would like to do is challenge perceptions, particularly of verbal feedback or written feedback, to, reduce, to do that to reduce teacher workload, to develop a group of teachers and schools to gain expertise, not just in critical research and to be more engaged with research, but in verbal feedback approaches. And the teachers involved come from a vast range of subjects. And the particular criterion here with UCL is looking at disadvantaged schools and pupils that are underrepresented in higher education. So how are we going to achieve this? Well, we first of all started by constructing a reflect, ask, investigate, innovate model for research and development. We wanted to start with what do we know about effective professional development? During this process, the asking investigation stage, we looked at an impact framework such as this one. We fixed the baseline, we collected data. We decided on a research question, which I'll show you shortly. And then we wanted to consider what would we want to know in, but at the end uh, as, as we start through the research. So with things like types of evidence, the pitfalls, the risks, the ethical risks, those types of issues. And then we, when we meet back in May, so I'll show you the, the time frame shortly, um, May 2019, we'd start to make a tentative claim about the resources that I've shared with the schools uh, and then consider how we would transfer this knowledge to a wider audience. So these are our seven skills. We did start with 10, but we've lost three along the way. Um, so I'm confident these seven will significantly, um, when this research comes out, make a huge impact on the profession. Um, so we've got schools um, all over the place, uh, wide demographics, number of pupils on roll. But here, here's a map for you so you can see where they're located. So we've got a couple in London, Surrey, um, Berkshire, Milton Keynes, Warwickshire, and one up in Batley in Leeds. So when I wasn't there with Mark Quinn, the academic, um, who's been working with our teachers, um, they developed this research question. Now I've circled here engagement, which is potentially a poor proxy, but we would have since defined this since I circled this image on the right. But this is the research question. To what extent does verbal feedback implemented for two terms improve student engagement amongst disadvantaged pupils? So we're looking at year seven, eight and 10. So that's 11, 12 and 14, 15 year old students. Um, of course, engagement, we can define as outcomes, attendance, behaviour, participation in class and examination outcomes. But we can get into that detail as we go through the project. Here's just some images of when we first met, talking about workload and ideas. And then in these two or three images here, I was working on particular techniques and forming the research question and ethics to then take back to our schools. These are the dates where we're at. So we've already been together three times. So the next time we meet will be in May. And then we hope to report findings, look at data in July, and then disseminate it with the rest of the profession in the start of the next academic year. So I'm very excited about that. So that's the first piece of research. Number two, um, so if you want to tag to your thoughts, so use at teacher toolkit and reply with a hashtag ed, so ed doc, ed, chat. Um, so this is my current focus. I've written about this on my blog. I'm very fascinated, not just how Twitter has enhanced my professional development, but I think I've surpassed that level where I've started to observe not just myself, but others start to influence education policy. 
Now, my original intention was to look at 35 OECD education jurisdictions, and obviously that's a lifetime's work for many people, never mind just myself. So I've tried to narrow, narrow, narrow the focus and look at just England. Um, my supervisors, so Professor Stephen Watson and Do uh, Mark Carrigan, um, Dr. Mark Carrigan, we are, my current focus is looking at these four things, and this, this stems from Professor Stephen Watson first writing about me and his observations of my influence on my, my social media journey in a book um, called Flip the System UK. And I first wrote about my own journey in a book called Education Forward. And Stephen tackles this dialogue in, in, in these four approaches that we are, we have a, social media provides us with freedom of speech, so democracy. Um, it also provides us with a platform to learn from one another, so a source of scholarship. Um, but then you can see as people grow with influence or particular themes, how it can steer activism and bring people together in terms of solidarity. So you could argue that this is potentially shaping teacher dialogue, the purpose of having a teaching union, and so on and so forth. Um, so this is where I'm currently at. Um, this is the Research in Practitioner Development Framework, first designed by the Open University. And uh, at the top here, I'm, I'm pretty much kind of about here still, and I, I need to start to narrow my focus. Um, that's where I currently am. So I'm looking to tackle my methodology over the coming three or four months. So why do I want to do this? Well, I um, want to demonstrate that teachers, teacher voice, teacher professionalism is, is shaping the narrative. I'd still have a ballpark figure about 10% of teachers using social media. So I gauge this from my own social media research as well as on the ground in schools. Um, you'll always get a mixture of lots of teachers using Instagram, Pinterest, YouTube and Facebook and Twitter. Um, but Twitter's generally in the minority still. Um, many more teachers are on Instagram and Facebook and obviously they have different social tools or purposes which then generate different types of usage. But I'm looking at Twitter because it's a conversational thread. Um, and I've, I've got my own evidence as well as observing others and you can see almost on a daily basis on Twitter, in all aspects of life, never mind just in education, how grassroots or individual people as journalists or reporters are influencing policy or policy makers. Um, there's a term called micro-celebrity, so it was first coined in 2001. Um, if I take you back to when Big Brother first started on, on, on the telly, or we look at various teachers that might be viewed as edgy Twitter celebrities. This is the actual academic definition, a micro-celebrity, so someone being well-known in their field, even no matter how niche it is. Um, so I'll talk about that in a bit more detail. For me in my own journey, this is my 10 years of my, my backgrounds in design, so this is me branding myself. So you can kind of see my banners from my website, how my ID logo has evolved from my photograph or using Keep Cam Carry On, um, and then evolving this into the red branding and then how my websites on the top right um, have evolved throughout the last seven or eight years to what it is currently today, teachertoolkit.co.uk. Um, my audience, so I always wrote for myself, but you can see I started with one follower, one reader. Um, my purpose was just to write for myself as therapy, but as you can see over the time, it's grown up to 208,000 readers uh, in last month. Uh, so uh, typically six to seven thousand daily readers. Um, so you can kind of see that you know this is a habit now, seven or eight years later, where it where it's gone to. There's just another way of looking at the data. So over nine million views. Um, you know, twelve thousand in one day. So it's nothing huge compared to big organisations, but for a mere humble blogger, an individual, it's it's pretty good data. Um, this is my analytics, so this is just a snapshot of last month. So 9 million people saw my tweets, which is frightening. Uh, it's a huge responsibility as well as a real privilege to be able to be followed or listened to by um, many people. But it's now not just me. I've grown up, uh, grown a team of bloggers uh, and freelancers who help make the website work. 
for a good eight years of my blogging life, um, I was a full-time school leader, um, deputy head teacher, and trying to do all this on top of being a deputy head was unsustainable. Um, I used to go part-time, um, went through all the ups and downs of workload and trolls and all sorts of things. Um, but you can see here how this has evolved into people that kind of make the site grow. And through conflicts of interest, companies wanting me to uh, share their work led to conflicts of interest, but also, I guess, accidental um, income. And obviously, if I return home from work five or six o'clock at night and then have to blog about a company or tweet them out, that was extra work. And I was sitting sometimes at my desk till midnight. And it, obviously, it was a choice. But when I started to realize having lost my job before I started all this, it was a great way to make an additional income and pay the bills. Um, so here's just a, a kind of indication of income. It's about a year old, this slide shot, but it has significantly grown since then so when i made a decision to step out of my full-time job and do this um i knew that i didn't have to i guess uh, uh quite privileged to rely on a, an additional income from a website um so it allows me to have a wider impact and start to have an influence at other levels so i'm i'm kind of unpicking this for my doctorate throughout the whole process um i've been involved with lots of copyright issues for myself of others I've been sued a couple of times, um, so it's very interesting. Countless troll attacks or critique. So here's one from a colleague who's criticising me for having premature ejaculation, not knowing that I had a premature child and lost another baby. Um, so you can kind of see sometimes people's feedback hurts. So I've learned to deal with troll attacks. And what I've found is when you're well connected, people often expose anonymous ID so that it has a purpose and yes we should be challenging of one another but when it starts to get personal when well particularly in education when we, we have to kind of call those things out and um, other things I've learned throughout the way so um, Jihadi John is an ex-student of my school so when you have an international story reach your school gates how you deal with the social media impact of that is um, quite a challenge and um, so that was a very very interesting period in my teaching career as a school leader um, and that's influenced a lot of my work so what I'm hoping to do is look at how over the last 10 years what have the key moments been in my Twitter journey so I've been blogging since 1999 um, when one web page took 30 seconds to load but when Twitter first evolved I created a personal account then at this point I created a professional account I separated the both so we've got at Ross McGill at Teacher Toolkit. And then what I hope to do and articulate, it partly a monologue to begin with, with my doctorate, is look at how I've perceived influence or how I think I've influenced or how others have influenced education policy. And by the time I finish my doctorate, you know, if it's six years long, so that's where there'll be the ending point, hopefully sooner than that. And um, but I've also looked at Rutgers University, me and former, so something called the Kardashian effect, so Kim Kardashian millions and millions of followers she is clearly an influencer but now because of her influence she's now not viewed as an expert on climate change but she's still asked to comment on that or even if she doesn't she'll put out a personal comment and then obviously it would cause people who are the experts somewhat disdain if in misinformation is being shared but millions of her followers would believe that that is the correct information so uh, Rutgers University tackles me and former uh, where people are selfie focused retweet me please more followers selfies selfies versus an informal which I would probably first attribute my first journey as creating resources sharing ideas building that content talking about other people's work as well as my own retweeting others I think that probably largely attributes to why I've got a quarter of a million followers I've done lots of reading, academic reading, as well as just general books. This is probably one of my favourites that I would signpost to people, Twitter Power, by Joel Com and Dave Taylor. Um, they talk about these four principles. Um, I always put the analogy, if your post man or woman knocked your door, you obviously get to know them and like them over time. You start to trust them. So if they suddenly put out a book of stamps in front of you and ask for a dollar or a pound to buy them, you probably would because you've got those hallmarks in place. So when it comes to online relationships, 
we need to ask ourselves, well, I like that tweet, I know Teacher Toolkit, I, it's a source of information that I trust, and uh, maybe the every five or ten tweets when Ross shares his book, I might buy that book. So I work on those principles, and over time, that's evolved into a, a social media plan, so to speak, where I try to follow a certain methodology without overbearing my social channels with too much of one thing. I've started to play around with uh, Netalytic and many others. Again, I'm probably going to stop this because I haven't quite narrowed my research of where I want to go. But this is just a social map of the term knowledge rich, which is currently a popular term used for curriculum dialogue in English schools, state schools. So this kind of looks at key organisations and all these little arrows and dots are connected to other people. Um, let me just delete these two images here. So you can kind of see a group of people and how they're connected and then I can start to track how often they tweet about it and who is controlling that dialogue. So it's very early days but whether I look at my own journey or key pieces of information such as grading lessons, grading schools, Ofsted's framework, knowledge rich curriculum remains to be seen. Okay, my last piece of research. Um, so again, tag me at Teacher Toolkit and use the hashtag Just Great Teaching. This is about my new book. Now, I wanted to put to good use my experience of visiting many, many schools over the last 18 months. What are the top 10 key issues that all schools face across Great Britain? Now, if we take funding away, because every school has to deal with funding, then what are those issues? So I'll share those shortly. But this is what I want to do to shape perceptions of British education. Yes, it's important to look at Finland and Shanghai and other places, but there's so much that we already do within that's great. And I think particularly politicians need to celebrate that more. So I want to highlight the challenges to showcase how schools deal with those challenges, to provoke politicians and bias, but also shape my own narrative. If you're familiar with my own journey, my last experience was quite brutal. Um, has put me off quite somewhat about returning to school leadership and I want to not deny that narrative because it's common for many teachers. I'm conscious that my influence I might be shaping everyone else to view that British education is in a bad place. In some cases it is, in other cases it isn't. So I also want to kind of start to move my own narrative away from what I would probably call a toxic situation over the last two or three years. So how am I going to do that? Well, obviously, this will be my fourth book. So I've learned to develop a framework of topics, headings, word counts so that I can track. I can't scroll this live screen here, but um, this document here. Um, but I've, I've written 60,000 words. I now need to edit it throughout March 2019. Uh, ready for publication in September. These are the book, uh, not the books, the schools. Um, so 10 schools, a PRU, independent school in Scotland, an independent school in England, boys schools, girls schools, the oldest school in the country, primary schools, a school in the middle of nowhere in Tregarran in West Wales, um, some great schools here, selective and non-selective area, sorry, non-selective school in Kent in a selective area, and so on and so forth. So these schools are all here. Um, thank you to all the head teachers and school leaders involved. Um, a real mix of independent boys and girls, number of pupils on roll. And these are the schools and where they've identified what they think they do really well. And these then inform the topics for the books. So the framework for the book is here's an issue that all schools face, why it's an issue. Here's five ideas from me. And here's the school talking about why they do this one thing really well, and this is what the head teacher says. And then each chapter will be summarised by uh, various people. So I've, I've pulled out some data. So I've got 10 head teacher responses, and I've got 300 teachers with a bit of data. So this is the challenges and strengths. So the current strengths that the head teachers highlight is dealing with pupil mental health, curriculum, teaching and learning special education needs and disabilities and lesson planning. You'll see here in terms of purple pupil mental health, current debate, social media, exclusions, knife crime um, is what head teachers would consider to be their greatest strength. Where they have the most confidence, there's no strong orange line here apart from teaching and learning CPD. So I've looked at the red line, pupil mental health and special education needs. Where they lack confidence, the blue bars, so planning, SEN, and research-led practice, which seems to be a pattern 
um, in other places. Um, so the challenges, um, so it's dealing with people, mental health, then research-led practice. So I'm looking at uh, the orange here. Um, in fact, doing this, I think I might have got that typed up wrong. So I will edit that. So I'm not going to reshoot the video. So um, I'll reshoot that and post the live slides on the blog. Um, teacher strengths, so the dark purple. Um, pupil mental health is the strongest. Then we've got a mixture of uh, SEN and behaviour. And then teaching and learning, as you'd expect, the large, tallest green bar. Where teachers identify the weaknesses, um, the dark blue, um, you're looking at research-led practice and teacher well-being, managing their own well-being. Um, so I find that quite interesting. Two more, teacher confidence. Where are teachers most confident? Well, it's teaching and learning and lesson planning, as you would expect. The dark blue, where they lack confidence, is research-led practice, teacher well-being, pupil mental health, and special education needs. Um, what are their challenges? So what they find the most challenging is would be their own well-being, um, as well as pupil mental health. But where they can cope or don't find it challenging is, is what you would expect, lesson planning and teaching, which matches the previous question. I'm currently looking through the book covers and coming up with design, so it's a nice part of the design process, which I really enjoy. Um, so it's 10 chapters, 50 ideas, 10 school voices, and it's out in September, and I hope to share it all around the country in lots of conferences. Um, so I'm going to finish there. I'm Ross. Thank you for listening. Uh, that's my verbal feedback project, my doctorate social media journey, and my insights from visiting schools all across Great Britain. You can get in touch with me at support at teachertoolkit.co.uk and read more on teachertoolkit.co.uk. Thank you for listening and send me your feedback. Thank you.